Hello everyone and welcome to this very special Hangout on Air. My name is Michelle Pekansky brock and I'm an instructional technologist at CSU Channel Islands in beautiful Camarillo, California. And I'm here today to uh, host a Hangout on Air, basically to share something really cool and innovative. Um, for those of you who follow my stuff, I've done Hangouts with lots of different faculty over the years, and a tool that I have taught with for a really long time is VoiceThread. And um, I have a lot of fabulous experiences myself with using VoiceThread and the way that it's impacted the way that I teach, the way my students learn. And um, when I caught wind of this pretty cool project um, that will be shared today, I was very excited to see if two wonderful people people named Jamie Hoffman and Mario Perez would be willing to join me in a hangout and share this project. So here we are. I'm going to have them introduce themselves in just a second, but before I do that, I do want everyone watching to know that we have the Q&A feature enabled in Google+. So if you're watching today through Google+, you can click on Q&A and type in your questions and we'll be taking those, addressing those throughout the Hangout on Air, okay? Uh, we also have a showcase feature that's been activated inside the Hangout on Air in Google Plus. And if you click on showcase, you'll have access to a series of links that connect with this topic. And so basically, there's some really great resources for you to dig a little bit deeper and learn a little bit more about the project that we're talking about today. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get things rolling. Um, Mario, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure. Hi. Um, uh, my name. Thank you, Michelle, for that lovely introduction. Um, my name is Mario Perez, and I am a lecturer at uh, Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University, located in Kyushu, um, and that's the southernmost island uh, of the mainland Japan. Um, I have been working there for two years. Um, I'm just fi finishing up working there, actually. I'll be moving on to a new university in Osaka from uh, next semester. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. I teach upper intermediate English at APU. And uh, APU is an international school for uh, mostly students from around Asia. And there are also some students coming from European nations, as well as students from Japan, all coming together. Uh, half the school is dedicated to learning English, and the other half is uh, dedicated to uh, management and uh, sociology. So, yeah, great. That's it. It's a beautiful university atop atop the mountain in uh, Oita. In and is that where you are today, Mario? I am not there today. I am at my family's home in. Um, uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico, if anyone's familiar with that, in America. I'm visiting family for the holiday, and I'll be back in Osaka in a few weeks. Great. On to Jamie. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you, Michelle, for inviting us to participate in this experience. It's, it's pretty cool to be able to share it with other folks and hopefully inspire them to uh, color outside the lines a little bit. Um, I'm Jamie Hoffman. I work at Cal State Channel Islands. And last semester when I did this module with Mario, I was a full-time lecturer. And um, recently, having um, done so much work with technology, I transitioned to being an instructional technologist in academic technology services um, while I retained teaching one class. So um, my, my job has changed a little bit. Let's see, um, I am in uh, Camarillo, California. I'm at the university. And if this looks this background <laughs> looks different than Mario's, that's because I actually am sitting in a sound booth in our faculty innovation and teaching studio. So I thought I would just let you know I don't have this at home. Home, although I'm sure very... You don't have egg crates on your wall at home? No? <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a part of my decor. Mm. So uh, that just to, to let you know where I'm at. And let's see, I have a variety of experience that I kind of bring to this, which is, is possibly what inspired me to at least... Um, participate in this with Mario, but I actually have about 15 years worth of work experience in student affairs at the university, and while working in student affairs, I also um, taught inside the classroom. So that's a little bit about my background, and if anybody wants to learn more about me, I think you have a link to my website in the um, showcase, so you can click on that and, and check out more information there. 
And Jamie, I don't know if you know this, but the um, low, the um, the Twitter name is still wrong on the the overlay. <laughs> we thought we had that correct, but the wrong one is uploaded. So oh, no. I don't know if you just want to turn on your um, lower third instead. But um, that was my fault, everyone, not Jamie's. I've been tagging the wrong Jamie Hoffman in tweets all day. So <laughs> <laughs> kind of a um, bad goof. Maybe that person's viewing the viewing us now because of yeah. the tweet. Yeah. Not a problem. Okay, and if there you, you go, if you activate the lower third, it will just turn your name on. There you go. That that that's it. There, that looks great. Okay, all right. So moving onward, um, let's hear a little bit about the big picture now. Uh, why don't you folks share me share with me a little bit about what the project entailed that we're here to talk about today and how it got started. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and start uh, by explaining how we got started. Um, Mario and I actually went um, to high school together. We were in the mm -hmm. marching band together, and indeed. that was just a few years ago. Not not a whole lot, long time ago, but no, 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 no. A few, maybe three, four. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've maintained contact throughout the years, and sort of have um, our careers have aligned here and there. And whenever we see each other, Mario usually comes to the states. Um, Every year, every other year, we managed to catch up, and we started dreaming about the potential of connecting work-wise, either through a publication or some sort of a project, and we kind of weren't really sure where to go from it, so for a few years, it didn't really go anywhere. And then um, what happened is that I, I took a, a part... It, I took part in a workshop last summer um, with a, a bunch of folks from um, Digi Media, Digital Media and Learning, DML, and um, they were talking about this idea of open connected courses. And I had a lot of questions about it, I had a lot of thoughts about it, but I definitely knew that I thought it would be a cool idea to try having a connection that that went beyond the boundaries of a university and even beyond the boundaries of a country. And I thought, how cool would it be for my students to connect with students, you know, in another country and learn alongside and with them? So I immediately was thinking, who could I contact? And then it was it was clear that Mario would work. Actually, I'll say. I will say, in the beginning, it wasn't clear, because in the beginning, I was thinking very <laughs> literally, and I think this is useful for people to know. In the beginning, I was thinking, well, I teach group communication, and I teach public speaking, and I teach, so I was thinking at the, the, the titles of the classes, and at first... Who else teaches that class that I could join up with, exactly, sort of thing, right? I, yeah. Exactly. I was like, oh, I don't know anyone that teaches that class. And then I just started started thinking, well, that's not what we do anyway. I mean, we do teach classes, but hopefully it's about outcomes, right? And I so I started thinking, well, what would really be the most meaningful? And then I thought about this module that I teach in my group communication class where students are learning about things like individualism and collectivism. And there's a lot of things that I do when I'm teaching in the classroom where I use a lot of active learning strategies, but it's really hard to make the idea of individual of individualism and collectivism and some of the other cultural dimensions come to life. Because you can show a video, but that's still kind of a, a flat experience. So that's when I thought, oh, Mario, that totally makes sense. And, um, you know, Mario, I just contacted him, asked him, hey, what do you think? And he was game for it. I don't think he fully knew what he was getting into. <laughs> he didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> so, Mario, do you teach a lot with technology? No. Well, I teach in um, a computer-assisted learning environment. But uh, not a lot of – you don't teach like, online? Not, no, I don't do that. No. Okay, no, okay. No. So she's stretching you a bit. Yeah, she okay. was. Yeah, definitely okay. had to work out some – Muscles. <laughs> this one, yeah, 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 some brain power. Yeah. Okay. But he was totally game for it. Yes, so, yes, yes. Um, it was great. We just started um, talking. And um, I'll let Mario take over at this point to sort of provide some context and describe what it is that we actually did to each other and for our <laughs> students. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, okay, um, I'll just quickly get into what, what it was that we did. Um, basically, um, Jamie's students and my students, at, her students at CSU and mine at um, uh, APU, um, basically learned about uh, some content material and uh, via mini lectures that we put on the voice thread. 
And then also um, for my class, I had to teach the students separately because uh, they didn't have the same reading material that Jamie was getting, mm -hmm. to giving to her students. Uh, my students, we decided that they couldn't quite understand the material if it were, uh, I think probably if I had given them a month to read the chapter, they probably would have gotten it. But to try to throw it at them in a short period of time would have been too, too much a task on them. So um, I lectured and helped them understand the material on my own separately. And that material was basically um, on what we call the layers of, layers of diversity, um, how uh, the U.S. and Japanese populations have changed over the years in terms of racial and cultural makeup, um, uh, learning about barriers to understanding different cultures, and learning about what were called Hofstede's uh, cultural dimensions. That was something I wasn't familiar with. Um, and I had to learn about that myself, and then I, I shared it with the students. And um, how to apply these dimensions uh, to both countries, America and Japan. Finally, uh, what, after they learned all this material, um, after Jamie's students read it, and surely they received lectures as well, and uh, after my students got all that material in their head, they went on to VoiceThread. And uh, probably with a two and a half week time frame, um, the students uh, learned that material and went on to the project. We put them into groups of three at APU and uh, groups of, I think it was up to five, Jamie, in your end? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had mm -hmm. five to seven in my groups. Five to seven in her groups. And uh, so they were in, so these groups in, so let's say altogether, uh, at most ten people in one voice thread were uh, working together. And uh, the students had to, they were instructed on the voice thread to respond to uh, three optional questions based on the content that they had learned, and then to one question that was required. So there were all sorts of mini lectures that they had to, uh, they had to view, and then it, uh, next to those lectures were questions uh, that the students had to respond to. Um, some did on video, some did on voice, uh, voice only. And uh, they had to, finally, in the required question, that's where they started to engage each other. So uh, they engaged their counterparts with questions uh, related and unrelated to the material. Um, so let me, can I interject for one second just yeah, to be sure that yeah. I want to summarize to be sure I'm understanding and that everyone else is on track. So we have a, a big group of students. I'm not sure how big, like Jamie, Jamie, how many students did you have total? So I had um, approximately seven, 70 students over two sections of the same class. Okay, so 14 students total, and that includes two sections. Is that right? 70. I had 70. Oh, 70. I thought you said 17. <laughs> 17. That would have been easier. Okay. So you've got <laughs> 70 class students. Of seven students, I would be fine. And Mario, how many students? No, on, on, the, on, the, exact, on the exactly, actually, uh, 17 in one. Uh, and, then, uh, and then in another class, I had 20. Okay, so what you did was you brought all of those students together and yes, then basically really distributed them to a series of small groups. That's right. Correct? So that there was right. a similar mix-up of both uh, Mario's students and Jamie's students in each group. That's right. That's okay. Right. Sorry. And the, group, the groups yeah. were, no, I just want to be sure I understood, yeah. the groups were set up in VoiceThread. That's right. That's right. So they had the optional questions and then the required question to go with. And then, like I said, on the required question, they started to engage each other on culturally specific questions about Japan and America. And... Um, after after they posed those questions to each other, you know, they had about five days to respond to each other. And, uh, yeah, the results were very impressive. Very, very impressive. cool. Very and cool. Uh, we're going to send it on over to Jamie, I think, to show us an example of what that actually looked like. It, it'll be more clear, I think, once they see uh, an example of it. I think so, too. And I, I imagine that there are people watching live as well as who will watch the archive who don't know what VoiceThread is. So seeing it, I think, is really important. But um, maybe, Jamie, could you also um, just address why VoiceThread came to mind for this, right? I mean... Yeah, sure. Um, you know, something that Mario and I 
I did that I hope most educators would do as well as they proceed with something like this is to th we started with what do we really want our students to get out of this and um, you know we did establish some objectives and there's there's our uh, the page that we um, directed all of the students to has the, the outcomes on it and that really drove our decision making uh, when it came to which tool was going to achieve what we wanted and so um, you know a time zone was obviously a, a key um, issue to consider here um, Mario was 17 hours ahead and his students were 17 hours ahead so that was um, not really going to make it possible to do anything synchronously but also um, I'm not sure that synchronously would have been optimal because the students over here at, uh, at CI um, they English for the most part was their is their native language and his students I think they needed something that would be asynchronous so they could have the opportunity to listen um, multiple times and it turned out that my students needed to listen multiple times to his students as well so um, something asynchronous worked and so um, on top of that we wanted it to be interactive we did not want this to be something where the students would just look at a video that we're you know putting up there or even create a video that someone else looks at and then talk about it inside the classroom we really wanted to see the students engage with each other so that they could learn with each other um, really to get to that next level of, of learning as opposed to just what we would do inside the classroom. And the final piece to it that really led um, voice to sort of just, it was kind of a clear um, best option is that we wanted it to feel, this is I know Michelle's favorite word and possibly one that she even coined, but we wanted it to feel human to students and a voice would let you do that because um, there's the, the video component and it does feel like a conversation. Um, there are limitations to it. It doesn't, you know, it's not the same thing as a synchronous meeting. But, uh, you know, with a synchronous meeting, you give up some things like, you know, the time for reflection. So, anyway, that's what drove us to using VoiceThread. Um, but, you know, something I want to share before I show an actual excerpt is, you know, some of this really is. Is, is the learning process that Mario and I got to go through as it was occurring because there's things that we take for granted on both sides and it was really important when I reflect especially after hearing Mario give his description it was really important that we knew our students and we knew where they were at you know because I was like, oh, just have your students read the same chapter as me. And oh, we have five days is a fast enough turnaround and um, Mario knew his students. He knew where they would be at. He knew how to appropriately support and challenge them. And that was an, an, a really important piece to this. And, um, you know, even so much as what to call our students was something that we took for granted. So at first we created the voice thread and every iteration, um, meaning every copy of it for all of the groups. So we had 12 groups. Um, we called the students um, American and Japanese students. <laughs> and we were ready to go live with the modules and Mario brought up a really good point which is that all of his students aren't Japanese and all of my students aren't American. This was after we recorded everything. <laughs> <laughs> and the modules about diversity, right? Yes. <laughs> yes exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I mean we had to be culturally sensitive ourselves, yeah. Right, and you know, and he was explaining to me, you know, the the different dynamics in diversity in his country, and I'm reflecting in our country, and it's like that's right, we can't say American students. And okay, this might seem a given to some of you out there while I'm telling you this, but when you're putting together a module, it's not necessarily your focus of what to call the groups of students, and you know I'm really glad that he brought it up he knew his students and so we were able to and and we did take the time to go back and make changes but Mario was also smart enough um, to realize that diversity has a very different um, context in Japan so he mm. had a, a conversation with his students and that ended up being something that that my students learned um, a great deal about so I'll pause on that later but you know some of this is the fact that you have to know your students but also you have to be prepared to learn through this as well I mean we 
I learned so much about diversity from doing this module about diversity. So um, anyway, well, with that said, what, what I'll do now is if, if it's a good time, I'll go ahead and show a really, really short excerpt. Um, the, the rest of our voice threads are actually um, open on the web, and our students have um, given permission for them to be that way. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to view more, you can do that. But I'll just do a quick screen share here. And and Jamie, after the screen share, we have our first question that's come in from Brad. All right. um, Belbus, I think that's how you say last name, Brad. Um, but it's a great question, so I'll follow up when, when you're done sharing. Perfect. All right. Well, here we go. I think in Japan, we have hyper distance culture. Japanese people are really concerned about their social status or social position. It can be seen in everywhere in Japan. For example, when I was in junior high school, I belonged to soft tennis club. The juniors had to prepare everything for seniors. We did not say anything against it because it was our culture. When I think about high power and low power distance, I think about the government in the United States. Um, our media especially is very open um, in either supporting the government, and then there's a lot of things in our media that are against the government. So we're very open, again, uh, when we're talking about the power lines uh, and where they're drawn, and we're less accepting of accepting power. Uh, we have a lot of protests. There's a lot of information out there in the United States against um, when we clash opinions, and we are definitely um, less ex willing to be accepting of others' opinions and beliefs. All right, so I will stop my... Before you stop screen sharing real quick, you know, go back to it just for a second, and maybe, um, you know, if this was someone's, I'm sorry, if this was someone's first glance at VoiceThread, can you just point to... Okay, so what you see here is the um, sort of VoiceThread interface, and the slide that's right in the middle of the page was created on PowerPoint. But VoiceThread does allow you to really use anything um, that, well, they call them artifacts, but that could include a video. So you could have students watch a video and then comment about it, an image or a presentation slide. And so I obviously, um, we used a, a PowerPoint presentation format because mainly our students were used to it. So that's the center here. And then what you see along the side are icons that represent the student's contribution. Now some of the, or, or ours for that matter, so I, uh, Mario and I alternated on our narrations on many of the slides, so I narrated this one initially. And then these little icons are the students and representing the different comments that they make. And students have the opportunity to change the icon to you know, be a picture of them, which you can see the student did here. And so as the students comment, you'll see that the um, box sort of pops out and their, their name and video comes up. And along the bottom, you, can, you can't see it in this um, picture here, but you can see when one comment starts and, and another one um, ends. Kind of. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, and if anyone is, is used to VoiceThread, and if this looks a little bit different, it is the new VoiceThread interface, which they're kind of transitioning into. Right. Um, okay, perfect. That's helpful. So let me share Brad's question. Mm -hmm. um, with the numbers of students you're working with, how did you facilitate the dialogue, interaction, among them? How did you structure or prompt people to respond to each other individually? And I know from using VoiceThread, if you're, you know, expecting students to interact with each other as opposed to just that prompt on the screen, right? How did you, right. how did you facilitate that? It's a great question. Um, well, some of it is, you know, setting kind of the clear expectations up front mm -hmm. about um, the timelines in that we ask students to go in and post their initial um, responses by one date and then come back and respond to their peers by another date. Now, um, I'll, I'll, since it's, this is a nice point in the conversation to say this, um, in reflection we wished that we would have made the dates further apart. 
Um, the other thing that we did to give them more time to contribute and such, but the other thing that we did was to set some minimum requirements with regard to how many posts that we expected. And um, we asked them to listen to their peers first. We talked. There were some introductory slides on our voice thread that talked about what a voice thread conversation is and what it means to be a part of a voice thread conversation. That it, it shouldn't be a situation where you just listen and then pop in and put your comment, but that you would listen to your peers so that you can learn from them. And we also established what our roles were going to be in the voice thread, and we made it clear that we weren't. Um, going to be the ones that were commenting on every slide and that we would just be watching because we didn't want them to feel like we were in, in um, inhibiting their group process. That's but such a good point. That's such a good point about not only their roles but what your role in the conversation is going to be. Right. If I could add to that as, the, as an instructor of language learners, um, I, did ha I do have to say that I had to help students sometimes understand the question that was being asked. So sometimes they would come to me uh, after class and ask me, uh, Mario, I'm not sure. I can see this person's asking me a question, but I'm not exactly sure what they want, what, what they're looking for, so I would help them with that. But, yeah. but that's as much as I interfered. I didn't interfere with anything else. Yeah, as Jamie said, we had clear instructions, so I think most people were fine with those. Some people needed help. Okay. And I think, you know, going off that, just one modification that, that we would make since it fits now is to approach it more, having more discussion with students about what a conversation is like and what it should feel like as opposed to setting the floor with regard to number of posts. Mm -hmm. And talking more, I mean, I've, I've now, I now I do this when I use VoiceThread. Now I'll say, look, I'm not going to tell you the minimums. What I'm going to tell you is I expect you to comment on the questions that resonate with you. And then if someone participates and comments on your thought, just because you're done with your requirement doesn't mean you should leave the conversation hanging, just like it would be kind of rude in a face-to-face -face setting to just look at someone and not respond if they commented on something you mm -hmm. said. So um, that's kind of where I'm migrating more to when it comes to using VoiceThread and this idea of having the discussion go back and forth. So um, anyway, that's what one kind of small change we would. Yeah, and I do find, um, and I don't know if you agree with me or not, but that I find that that's the hardest part. And I don't know if Brad would agree with me or not, but um, you know that that just that facilitation and establishing the norms and ensuring that they, you know, students know how to have this conversation, you know, because it, it is such a different environment, the voice yeah. thread. It has, it, it feels a like a live form. conversation, but it's not, right? And so you do have to kind of follow up and have that, maintain the connection with the conversation over time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot more accountability, really. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sure. And I understand that you collected some feedback from your students, right? We did. Um, we collected data in a uh, post-module reflection. It was um, optional for our students to participate. And we're, I'm still reviewing um, at least the, the my students' responses, and, and I hope to be able to kind of um, code it and, and publish it for future reference. But we did collect their responses, and, and overall they were really pretty positive. I'll let Mario go ahead and talk first about his um, students' perspectives, and then I'll um, add in. Okay, so uh, we calculated, yeah, that uh, at least on my end for my students, that 82% of them, roughly 80% of them, responded to the reflection survey that Jamie mentioned. Uh, Agreeing, strong, agreeing or strongly agreeing at least that the, uh, the module helped them practice English. And that was one of our uh, goals. Uh, that was one of the outcomes we wanted uh, when we first set it up for my students. That, uh, that, was, that was one of the, the outcomes that we had desired. Um, so 82% of them had responded to either agree or strongly agree on that point. And uh, I spoke with one student in particular uh, at the end of the semester, and I asked him what he felt was the, uh, what was to him the, the, the best part of the class, and then also what was the worst part of the class. I won't talk about that one, but uh, he, he, I asked him what was the best part of our course. And there's so much involved in the upper intermediate course. Um, he, he responded that it was, his favorite part was the voice thread. 
He said, hands down. He said he learned more from the voice thread and the interaction with the students in America than he did from any other situation um, in the course. He just felt he got so much out of it. And uh, so we were very pleased with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, some other things that we uh, <laughs> that I learned from the feedback was I need to, because, as Jamie mentioned earlier, we put it all together in a short amount of time um, probably because her, her semester starts earlier than mine. And so it was, you know, we, we try to put it together within a couple weeks. Um, and uh, I need to find a better way for grading it, um, for, at least for my students, was, was how to reward them with a grade. Uh, that was, that's really important to my students in Japan. And uh, one student said, uh, and I quote, she said, it's totally good, nice. But I hope teacher at APU take our score to bonus points if we do this. Um, I, I didn't have much, I didn't, because the, the grading rubrics for the course had already been set up, I didn't have the chance to find a place for this. So all I could do was give them participation points. But I had a feeling that if, if they knew there was a, a grade involved in this, a strong grade, like I'm going to be observing and evaluating them closely. And if here you had a rubric that, just for the actual a activity. rubric for this activity, it would have gone even it would have gone even smoother than it did. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and that's interesting because some of um, I uh, and what we what we should say is that our semesters aren't just a little bit different. <laughs> I started in um, mid August, and Mario's semester didn't start until mid October. October sixth. Yeah, and and we couldn't get this project off the ground for a week or two later. Right, we couldn't, well, and it just wouldn't have made sense, I know, in, in your class. And so Mario was on, on break from school, on, on holiday, as, as um, he calls it in Japan. And so it was, it was tricky because I did build it into my syllabus, but I built the idea into the syllabus. Mm. And so some of my students in their feedback, they were frustrated because I put due dates in there for online module work and they ended up being just a little different. It wasn't like they had to do a lot of work earlier but um, it was just not on the date of the syllabus and so that that th did throw some of my students off and so you know it's a realistic challenge that's worth sharing you know because if you want to collaborate with someone in another country they're not necessarily on the same calendar and so we're now in a situation where Mario has moved schools and he doesn't start until the end of April so we're not likely to actually redo this module until the fall uh, if, if we are able to do it which he's at a new school and you know there's very different you know, feelings about this kind of stuff anywhere you go. So um, we'll, we'll see if that happens. But with regard to more about our students' perceptions, overall, 89% of the students who responded said that they have strongly agreed or agreed that it was exciting to work alongside students in another country. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, and at yeah. Cal State, I just love to hear the, the word exciting in a yeah. student learning experience. That's very cool. Exactly. Yeah, and um, here uh, at CSU Channel Islands, one of our pillars at the university is to gain international perspectives and many of my students especially in one of my classes it was a night class they're re-entry students they're adults and they're not going to necessarily get the same opportunities to travel abroad as others so I kind of thought this was a neat way for them to gain some some perspectives but um, some other just briefly some other comments that the students shared is that um, I just talking about the, the fact that VoiceThread allows you to reflect, one student said, I had the chance to collect my thoughts on how I truly see my culture and having to explain why. It was nice to reflect. So mm. that, that was interesting. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I've kind of said this, but I think that the module in, introduced um, diversity in a way that you just couldn't do in a textbook and inside the classroom. And one one student said, I learned, and you have to figure, forgive me reading this because it's actually word for word how they wrote it, I learned that what is normal here can be very different in other countries. We are used to diversity here and experience a lot of different cultures, but in Japan there are ethnicity of their people is pretty constant and unchanging. Another thing I learned is Japan has a lot of uh, a high power distance in its culture. So the feedback was generally, 
you know, overall, and there, there's more data that we have, but it was really pretty positive. This it was. did encounter some challenges, but here's the cool, uh, my, this, my students, the biggest challenges they encountered was that they couldn't understand and had to work really hard to understand the Mario students. But can, I, can I say probably one reason for that is you will find a lot of students here, in my experience, don't have their own computer. So a lot of them were going to their friend's house. I was going to ask They were about all that. asking, do, can we use VoiceThread on, on iPhone? Right. And some of them had trouble with VoiceThread on iPhone. Not, you know, so, yeah, that, that was, and so the mic wasn't picking up. And right. But, but let me bad. say, though, that um, that was a lesson that we learned, like encourage yeah. people to use the mic. But here was the thing is that, I mean, your, your students were amazing considering the fact that, I mean, they're, they're here to learn English. That was, that was yeah. the point. That's but their point, yeah. we'll, for, and, and I'll talk, I'll, I'll mention um, some of our learning lessons, how that, I think there were some power differences that we didn't realize until afterwards that didn't necessarily set the students in Japan up for as much success as my students. But um, one of the things that was cool, though, is that my students, instead of just being frustrated, they realized that this is a module about diversity. So they would say it's hard to understand them, but it's cool to have this opportunity to be pushed to learn. And, mm -hmm. and it made them realize, well, this is probably what it's like for the students in Japan to, to um, hear us. So there was a lot of reflection and, and empathy, analysis also. exactly throughout the process from um, from the students over here. One so, of my students said the same thing. She she was mentioning that uh, she struggles with a lot of English classes don't have content. There's no. It's not a content based course. It's it's grammar. It's writing. It's listening. It's speaking. It's all text based textbook based. And she said this was the first class that she experienced where it was. There was, there was content, so it was about diversity, you know, and, and the, the topic itself made it easier to approach other uh, people, foreigners, as we say, you know, to, to, to approach Westerners, you know, she felt like it, would, it was easier because they're going to understand her more because they have to, because in this, you know, the content, you have to be, say, you, have to be uh, you know, sensitive, yeah. and so that was really good for her. So I have a question here um, that just came in from Brad again, and um, I'm just realizing that I should have I should have clarified this at the start of our conversation. But you are we're both this we're not talking about fully online classes. We're talking about students that you had in a classroom with you, and then they completed this outside the classroom. Correct. Right. Correct. We both had fully online, or sorry, fully face-to-face -face classes. Okay, I just yeah. wanted to clarify that because I think that plays a little bit of a role in this, at least in my head, this question that Brad's asking. Um, and we may have already touched upon this a bit since he submitted the question, but what was the tech support overhead for each of you? Did students need much assistance? Do you have suggestions for people doing this on the scale you undertook? And the reason I wanted to clarify that is because I think that when you're, if you're dealing with students fully online, um, it, it does kind of change um, the dynamic of how you support them, right? So when you have them in a classroom and you can do live demos and answer questions synchronously and then have mm -hmm. them go complete the assignments outside of class, I think that's just a different type of um, experience than having everything fully online. Mm -hmm. So with that said, do you have anything else that you'd want to add about, um, you know, the kinds of assistance that students needed um, and advice you want to give in that regard? I find that the voice thread was really easy. There weren't that many technical difficulties to deal with at all. And in fact, the, the technical difficulties we faced were, were mainly my fault. And I would have students who are much more tech savvy than me say, if we do this, then look. And, we, and I noticed we were having so many problems at the beginning. And then I was like, wait a minute, my, uh, we're using uh, Internet Explorer. <laughs> so let's go to uh, you know, Google Chrome. It works so well on Google Chrome, and there were no, there were no. Sorry, Internet Explorer. Um, there were there were no uh, issues after that. You know, it was very easy. And I didn't face any problems. Yeah, I, I mean, and I would just say two things to add to that. One is that. Um, oh, I totally lost my first train of thought. But the second piece. <laughs> was um, I used a little bit of scaffolding with my students. 
I didn't actually do much demoing um, mm -hmm. of VoiceThread inside my classroom for this module, but I had had one other online module with my students. The topic was technology and virtual groups, so it really didn't make sense to me to have a face-to-face -face discussion about technology and virtual groups. So as one of the activities for that, I had an, a VoiceThread that I narrated and um, asked them to participate in early on in the semester and um, the threshold was a little bit lower so I kind of um, I think I've prepped them just a little bit for that and then I would say the biggest technical challenge was just figuring out um, where to place the voice thread and how to get students to log in because my institution does have a site license and at the time you had to log into our learning management system our students needed to log into our learning management system to access voice thread Mario students did not so Mario students um, he was really good. He, ahead of time, sat with them all and had them just start by creating their VoiceThread accounts. And then on my end, I did a lot of the work of, of setting up the instructions and I just had to make it extremely explicit that my students would log into our LMS and tell them where to click and then to, and where to access VoiceThread. Since that time, we actually have a better um, integration at this point or a different kind of integration so I could now just have my students log in on um, the web and just doing a little bit of a different process it's a little more seamless but we didn't want to confuse students because they already have a, um, a voice thread account my students already had a voice thread account by way of being a CI student and if they created another one to participate outside of the LMS they would have had two and it would have been confusing so um, we had to play around with that a little bit I actually think that I corresponded a bit back and forth with VoiceThread support and they were really helpful about making clear what could and couldn't be done and um, we just had to make the instructions very clear but really that's what you know you need to do anyway in these kinds of situations right you need to make explicit things that you might not even really need to be explicit so um, as far as technically, other than that, like Mario said, I mean, it, it, the interface is just really straightforward to use. So, in other words, to summarize how you shared that, because I think um, I, there might be some people who are a little confused, because there is, when you have VoiceThread integrated into a learning management system like Blackboard, which is what CI uses, it does create a secure environment if you're creating a group that only your students are members of and you're dragging the voice thread into that group and that's right. the only in, you know way you're sharing that voice thread right. but Jamie what you did was you still had students authenticate through the learning management system to get basically to their vo activate their voice thread account but the voice thread you created you shared so that anyone with the link could comment in them right yes. and so Mario's students are creating these free accounts your students are still activating their voice thread account or getting to their voice thread account through the LMS but they're coming to a voice thread that has been shared with anyone who has the link correct That's right. okay mm -hmm. so people who use voice thread I think that might make a little bit of sense mm -hmm. And, and I would call it that's that's something interesting to learn right now. Actually, that's something that uh, I could <laughs> that probably would have eliminated a, a lot of issues in the beginning. With you know asking for permission from the school and whatnot, you know. Well, so, and that's, yeah, actually a, that's a good point um, that we should emphasize is that. Um, we had a lot of it because the voice threads are open they are on an open web page and Mario did secure permission from every one of his students mm. to have that open because um, confidentiality in Japan is different even than this mm. country. so we are particularly sensitive to that so anyone that would yeah. be doing this would need to, to uh, consider uh, the confidentiality laws or rules that, that sort of govern the country Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've talked about um, lessons that you learned from your students and uh, throughout this whole uh, conversation you've been great about kind of showcasing little tidbits of advice. Is there anything else you'd share, um, you know, with anyone out there who's thinking, oh, I'd want to try this? Um, yeah, we yeah, we have a few things that, that we'd love to share that were our learning mm. lessons. Um, one of them is don't ever do it with a friend because you'll hate them at the end. No, I'm just kidding. 
I no. thought we hated each other going into it. No? no okay. That's true. No, that's, <laughs> that's why I wanted to torture you with this. So, um, no, one of the, okay, so something that we realize that it's kind of like from a student affairs perspective, I'm kind of like, oh, why didn't I figure that ahead of time? But we focus so much on what we wanted to get out of the module and what that would look like in action that I think it would have been good to sit in the student's shoes and realize that maybe it would be good to expand out the experience such that maybe we a week ahead of time or two weeks ahead of time had some sort of ice breaking activities using VoiceThread that were even lower risk um, but also that got them a, a chance to get to know each other especially Mario students so now I mentioned earlier that Mario students were at a, a bit of I, I say power um, difference because not only he had less students and so there were not not only were there less students in the group so there were often sort of three of his students and up to seven of mine seven but his students weren't native English speakers and they're having to contribute to this conversation in English that's about something that some of them hadn't really necessarily studied yet and so you know there that's part of the point that was part of the experience and he articulated how his his students felt like they were challenged and benefited from it but I also think there are some things that we could have done to ease everybody into it and one of them being just a couple of slides maybe ahead of time about getting to know you um, you know say your name and some interesting facts about you and have the dialogue um, start a few weeks ahead of time that was not about the module so that was yeah. one lesson. Mark. I've had similar experiences just using my own group of students. That low stakes start is really a great way to just kind of break the ice, not only socially, but also with like, you know, getting to know the, the, the technology, right? Right, exactly. Mm. So, and yeah, and yeah, a, another issue that we had discussed, um, Jamie and I, was that, uh, and my students and her students even brought it up, I'm sure, is that. Um, you know, we they wanted the students wanted you know an opportunity to continue talking with the other students. It kind of just stopped after the deadlines and everything. And 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 my students were adding this 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 project on top of an array of other things they had to do. It was so much involved in in our course uh, uh, at APU, and so they uh, you know so they didn't once it was the deadlines were done. Everyone just stopped. You know, move on to the next thing. But but so many students mentioned to me that they wanted to continue, you know, well, we'd like to talk to this person anymore, could we? And I'm like, I don't know, if you if you go ahead and say something on VoiceThread, will the student respond to you? I don't I don't know, you know, well, have they shut down on their VoiceThread end as well? I don't know. So uh, that would be something that we would make a post-module session so that the students can com continue communicating or even allow them to say, hey, look, here's my Facebook, here's your Facebook, let's continue talking. And I think that, that, you know, that feedback is really indicative of just how effectively you were able to start f fostering community between these, sure. these students in just such a short period of time. So sure, sure. that's pretty powerful to have that type of request. Yeah, that was cool. Mm. Um, Give me another from you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have another. Yeah, go. Oh, no, well, I, I have more, but um, one was that uh, more time to plan. Yeah. Uh, we, we definitely need more time to plan. Uh, again, uh, Jamie and I, uh, we, we rushed, we put a lot of effort, lots of hours into preparing it in a short amount of time. So uh, time to collaborate, uh, aligning outcomes, uh, creating the presentation itself, uh, securing student permission. For me, that was something that took quite a bit of time. and. Um, I, I don't write in Japanese very well, but I can speak in Japanese enough. So um, explaining to them the you know the waiver that I, I wrote for them to sign, you know the, the call up, you know saying you know I, I allow you to do this, I allow you to do this with the video, this, and I had to explain to them what all of that meant, um, so that I'm you know not infringing on their rights. So that that took a lot of time. Um, that that's something I should have done way in advance, perhaps. Um, and explaining the module to my students. Uh, again, Jamie's group had the reading material. Um, my, my students didn't. So, yeah, more time to plan, I think, and get the ideas across to the students so they don't feel rushed or worried. Yeah. 
So at, at the same time, do you, do you think that maybe, I mean, planning is always great, and I know you put a ton of work into this. Um, Jamie, I think you and I actually interacted the week when you were making the groups and copying your content, and, oh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> at the same time, isn't there something to be said about just, let's just do it and see what happens? Right? Yes. Yeah. Jamie was the voice to keep saying that too. Because I kept like, let's, we should fix this, we should fix that. She's like, this, I kind of think we should just let it go, Mario. <laughs> let's, let's see what yeah, they do. We had so much talk about, um, you know, okay, here was an, a, t a piece that we talked a lot about. Should Mario's, should our um, slides be translated? And if so, that was going to lengthen the time. And we didn't know because it was kind of not the point. The point for his students was for them to, you know, build on their English. So it was just a little things. And there was just that, you know, we both wanted it to be really good. But I also wanted it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But, you know, one of the things I want to stop and, and mention here is this. Okay, this... Doing something like uh, an online module with VoiceThread on your own as an instructor, at least it was for me, it's not that much work. I'm pretty familiar with it. It was easy to do. Adding in the variable of another person in another country was a million times more work than I ever thought it would be. And some of you who are sitting out there might think, I don't have time for that, especially, you know, if you're trying to publish and you're going or you're going through RTP. And one of the things I want to say is that um, for me, when we started this process, I submitted an IRB application so that I could collect data from the students and utilize that to then turn around and publish. So just because you experiment with technology and you take this time to put something like this together doesn't mean it's distracting from what you might be held accountable to producing. And I think that's an important thing because time can turn people away from experimenting. But, you know, we can publish a about our practice, and so um, I don't know that I, 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 I think I'd like to do it again before I publish um, in, in the way that I want to. And also, you know, what's interesting is that in Japan they don't have IRBs, and our IRB wants a letter from the cooperating institutions IRB. That's they don't, so we've kind of encountered another, you know, sort of barrier to being able to. I, I as at, in this moment don't have permission to publish Mario's um, students' perspectives. So we need to still do a little bit of work of, about navigating that, hmm. because I think that we should publish together in both of our students. Yeah voices should be heard. So that's sort of um, in still in progress. But um, I did want to mention that, yes, it was a lot of time and there's a lot of value in it, but there can be value, you know, in, in any way that you kind of want to make it work for you. So um, Mario, let's see. Oh, I, the, another recommendation, of, we already touched on this, was to use microphones. Um, or recommend students to to use it. And if there's any mini grant you could ever apply for, that um, for for a project like this, I would say investing in, in microphones. <laughs> microphones would, it would students. be worth it because the varying degrees of sound became a barrier in a way that it just didn't need to be. And if I had more time in class, actually, I could have had the students do it in class. And there are microphones. Or another sort of way to kind of frame that conversation is, wouldn't it be interesting if we could think of a microphone as an essential tool in the toolkit for, the for yeah. education? <laughs> you know, that's yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. kind of my dream. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so something I was thinking about when you were sharing how all this got started is um, how much the two of you, well, at least I perceive how much the two of you trust each other, you know, kind of having that foundation of friendship to do this. Um, and this is really about taking risks and trying new things. And, um, you know, a lot of people will hear great ideas and even kind of have a vision of how they could make it work, but then actually doing it is something very different. So I thought there was something really neat about, um, you know, the, two, the fact that the two of you feel comfortable with each other and you're willing to take this leap kind of leap of faith together and just go for it. Yeah. Um, I just, I really love that partnership between uh, faculty. I think that that means a lot. And it also, to me, makes me think about how important it is for us institutionally, across institutions, globally, to continue to push for faculty to connect with each other. Yeah. Um, 
because we still, you know, are so much in this modality of having us, you know, teach with those who are face to face with us on campus. But mm. with the way technology is today, you know, we can t really we have this amazing professional development community that's worldwide, and mm. um, that was just a takeaway that I had as I was sitting here listening to you. So yeah, it wasn't it wasn't very difficult at all. I mean, there were times when we couldn't contact each other based on you know because she was asleep or I was asleep. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but generally speaking, but that doesn't mean that he didn't try. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, the other thing that I think I would just touch upon as we wrap up is <clears throat> the asynchronous nature of it. Because as you've just said, you know, this could not have worked with synchronous tools. And I also still think that um, there's still this kind of mindset, and anyone out there is free to agree or disagree with me. But in general, in mainstream education, there's this mindset of, oh, well, you know, we need to use a synchronous tool to kind of have the sense of presence and to humanize and to have those voice interactions. And um, just that realization that, well, no, that's not true. And it's not to say that synchronous tools aren't great because we're using one here, but there, there are many wonderful outcomes that come from using asynchronous tools, um, particularly those that integrate voice and video like VoiceThread. And I think that you, you mentioned so many of those, the reflection of the students, the ability to listen multiple times, mm -hmm. um, and just being able to cross connect across the world without having to wake each other up in the middle of the night. So <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah, those yeah, are yeah, really yeah, important yeah. points. Yeah. You, know, the, the la you know, you talked about taking risks, and one of the things, you know, as we close out, that I want to say, though, is that um, still focus on what your outcomes are, because people can get really um, enamored by tools and what's the latest and greatest, but make sure that it does align with what you want to achieve is the first thing, and then along those lines, um, people have been very excited to hear about what we did together, and we were excited about it as well. But I didn't want people to get too excited because I didn't know if the students would like it. And, mm. and now being in ed tech, I see a lot of times that we are like, oh, that's so great what you're doing, and mm. that's great. I think it's great. Mario thinks it's great. Mm. But to me, you know, if the students don't think it's valuable and – if they aren't learning, which sometimes the students may not think it's you know enjoyable, but they are learning, maybe that's okay too. But that's what's you know most important yeah. that you drive the conversation. And and we're talking you to, to you today um, with a positive perspective because they did uh, have positive results. But I would I would report the opposite as well. And you know there there are some students that I think struggled with it, but. Yeah, um, who who asked for the synchronous method? Yeah, you know of course. Yeah, yeah so. Mm. But Some you people know, struggled, but those mm. things in in mind don't just you know um, get so caught up with how how great it seems, you know. It, mm. And the other side of that is that um, this information, this data that you now have from the students, you can share that back to a future group of students, right? Before mm. you do it, right? Because then that's something for them to reflect on and really kind of see the mm. power and the impact that this project yeah. has already had on other students. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, students always. Um, I think when they hear from other students, it resonates differently with them than when they hear it from you. So, <laughs> as, as far as language learners go, uh, it, it it was really great because you know uh, they they got to I, I heard time and again how students got to listen to the speaking the speakers over and over and over again, or they they would play it back over and over till they understood it, and that that and then they get to plan their response, and that eliminated the fear factor that you get in convert real online conversation. So th this was great for language learning, I think, uh, altogether. Well, this, this has been amazing. And we are at about an hour now. And I think okay. that's a good time to maybe wrap up, unless there's anything, final last words uh, one of you would like to share. Do you feel like you were able to cover everything you wanted to share? Yeah. Try okay. it out. OK. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> if you're a teacher, it's great. Yeah, try it out. Be willing to take risks. and, and mm -hmm. Actually, this is a good point. If something doesn't work, um, your students don't think you're stupid and they don't blame you for it. They understand that technology doesn't always work the way it's supposed to and, and they are understanding. And I've had many experiences where that's validated. So mm -hmm. um, just you know, keep that in mind. 
And they can be excited about it at the same time, which is a big takeaway. Okay. Well, thank you to both of you. You are fabulous. Thank you for sharing and kind of, you know, pushing all this forward, um, contributing it to everyone else. And um, I'm going to wrap up the broadcast now. So long, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.